is a love fest. <laughs> Hollywood's heartbreak kid was arrested again on November 25th, just short of four months after his release from prison. Since his release, he's also been making a comeback on Ally McBeal and trying to walk the straight and narrow. I had a really serious, sick love affair with cocaine. Sometimes the roles he chooses blur the lines between fiction and reality. You conned your way through rehab, you lied, you stole. I know, but why don't you just give me a break? I just need you to be my father for one goddamn day. Just, just help me. He gave an extraordinary performance of somebody who was like spiraling down into a drug bottom. How much of that was based on his own experience? I mean, who, who cares? You know, he was good. Uh, he knew what that character was about. Downey is a veteran of over 40 films. Funny, fast-talking, cute, and a free spirit. But he's always wrestled demons. Some people read a book, take a drink, screw their co-star, and some people stick a needle in their arm. Addiction to drugs and alcohol placed him in prison and the headlines. It's like I have a shotgun in my mouth, and I've got my finger on the trigger, and I like the taste of the gunmetal. It's been a difficult road to recovery. Since 1996, Robert Downey Jr. has seen as many courtrooms as movie sets, held prisoner by an addiction he's unable or unwilling to shake. I have been called the menace to society. <laughs> Downey's story is one of extremes. He's an Oscar nominee in constant demand by Hollywood's A-list directors. You can't be Chaplin. The guy I hired did the best comedy drunk I ever saw. But he was old. I don't pay a hundred a week to juveniles. Chaplin will become the centerpiece of Downey's career. His portrayal of Charlie Chaplin is uncanny. <sighs> Although Robert Downey Jr.'s time in prison still doesn't appear to have damaged his professional reputation, addiction has taken a toll on his personal life. The most painful thing is the separation from his six-year-old son, Indio. There's no way to explain how uh, spiritually debilitating it is to be taken out of the loop of your life. It's like dying. He's been in this place many times, free, clean, and sober, only to relapse back into addiction. Will this time be different? Has he really changed? Like a friend of mine who put it behind him said, uh, he calls cocaine the lady. And he said, the only way you can respect the lady is to stop seeing her altogether. And that was always difficult to me because, you know, breaking up is hard to do. Figured out who's at the top of the class? Like his father, our class president was the pitcher for a college baseball team. The answer when we reveal his identity as the class of 2000 continues. politics. Several of the politicians in the class of 2000 saw opportunities slip away during the campaign year. John McCain was one of them, but as you'll see, he's built an entire career by overcoming adversity. The guardian of a military legacy. It was always a certainty that I was going to go to the Naval Academy. A rebel against the world. If you didn't want to live on the edge, then you never went to a party with John McCain. A survivor against the odds. Planes are exploding, rockets are exploding. From prisoner of war, I'm sure that I will get well. To presidential hopeful, and I promise you, as president of the United States, that will stop. John McCain, America's most celebrated prisoner of war, a rebel in his youth, and now a political maverick. The Republican senator from Arizona who made a bid for president, McCain is not your run of the mill politician. After five and a half years in a Vietnamese prison, John McCain comes home to a fundamentally altered world, and he dedicates himself to catching up. I did want to catch up. I did want to hurry. I did want to read and study as much as I could, and I wanted to get back into, into life. By 1980, he marries for the second time. Cindy Hensley is a pretty 25-year-old bride from Phoenix, Arizona. Three years later, he's elected to the Senate. There's an attack underway on Iraq, on the city of Baghdad. It's 1991, and America is at war with Iraq. And suddenly, 
the press can't get enough of John McCain. This proves especially true when Iraq captures American POWs. They are taught to do the best, the name ranks, social security number and date of birth, and then resist to the best of their ability. And as, and as we acknowledge, they are resisting to the best of their ability. Less than a year later, McCain is re-elected to the Senate. In Arizona, John McCain uh, wins a second term. It's probably time for us to consider moving forward with our relations with the Vietnamese and fully heal the wounds of that unhappy chapter in America's history. In the fight to normalize relations with his one-time arch enemy, the agreement is signed in 1995. But McCain pays a political price. He reached out to the president and offered to give him political cover. And it was not popular with many of the you know, more conservative people in his own party. In spite of that, McCain runs for the Republican presidential nomination in September 1999. John McCain is running for president to reform government. He's McCain's landslide victory in the New Hampshire primary looks promising. But by March 2000, Bush pulls ahead and McCain withdraws from the race. He returns to his seat in the Senate. John McCain, the young rebel, the courageous combatant, the successful politician. So as interesting as John McCain made the early months of the presidential race, there was nothing in the campaign year to prepare us for the way it ended. Because when the Chad finally settled, Al Gore had won the popular vote but lost the election. And in the year 2000, he got as close to being president as anyone can. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. He is the ultimate runner-up. His concession speech ends a grueling, confusing, and complicated 36-day post-election fight to determine the outcome of the presidency, and ends a year of enormous highs and lows for Gore. Early in the year, Vice President Al Gore, the son of a prominent Tennessee senator, sweeps through the Democratic primaries, quickly dispatching his opponent, Bill Bradley. Among those victories is a decisive primary win in Florida, a state whose tangled presidential vote will ultimately do him in. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my husband, our next president of the United States, Al Gore. At the Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles, it's not his wife's introduction, but their kiss, which energizes his campaign. The father of four brings his family into the fight for office, as his oldest daughter, Corinna Gore Schiff, becomes a key advisor. And while his liberal platform is no surprise to the rank and file, Gore's choice of running mate raises some eyebrows. The next Vice President of the United States of America, Joe Lieberman. Through the fall of 2000, Gore beats the campaign trail and appears in a series of debates with George W. Bush. Debates that remind many of Gore's reputation for playing too loose with the facts. Under the governor's plan, Social Security will be bankrupt by the time you retire if he takes it out of the Social Security Trust Fund. Under my plan, it will be, its solvency will be extended until you're 100. On election day, the results are confounding. Gore wins the popular vote, trumping Bush by 330,000 votes, but he must then ride a five-week roller coaster until the Florida vote is resolved. I am not uh, uh, tortured over what-ifs at all, and, and in fact, uh, I, I believe we're going to win this election. And in the end, after weeks of wrangling in the courts, Florida's electoral votes go to George W. Bush. Al Gore falls three electoral votes short of the presidency. Some have asked whether I have any regrets. And I do have one regret, that I didn't get the chance to stay and fight for the American people over the next four years. For more on the year 2000, log on to our website after the show, www.msnbc.com. Our next headliner in the class of 2000 is one in a million who once worked as a sportscaster in Denver and a movie reviewer in Los Angeles. Can you guess who he is? Find out when Headliners and Legends, the class of 2000 returns. everyone. So who is the member of the class of 2000 who once worked as a sportscaster in Denver 
and a movie reviewer in Los Angeles. Well, he's been on television for over 40 years now, but it's safe to say that this has been the breakout year for Regis Philbin. I'm ready. Ready, audience? Yeah, we're all set. Let's play. Who wants to be a millionaire? Here we go.